Thank you for standing by. This is the conference operator. Welcome to the fourth quarter 2023 results conference call for Canadian Utilities Limited. As a reminder, all participants are in listen-only mode and the conference is being recorded. After the presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To join the question queue, you may press star then 1 on your telephone keypad. Should you need assistance during the conference call, you may signal an operator by pressing star and 0. I would now like to turn the conference over to Mr. Colin Jackson, Senior Vice President, Finance, Treasury and Sustainability. Please go ahead, Mr. Jackson. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. We're pleased you could join us for Canadian Utilities fourth quarter 2023 conference call. With me today is Canadian Utilities Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, Brian Scrobot as well as ACO Power's Chief Operating Officer, Bob Miles, and ACO Energy Systems Chief Operating Officer, Wayne Stensby. Before we move into our formal agenda, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the numerous traditional territories and homelands on which our global facilities are located. Today, we're speaking to you from our ACO Park head office in Calgary, which is located in the Treaty 7 region. This is the ancestral territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Sisika, the Kainai, and the Pagani Nations, the Tsisinu Nation, the Stoti Nakoda Nations, that include the Chikniki, Bears Paw, and Good Stony First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. We honor and respect the diverse histories, languages, ceremonies, and culture of the Indigenous people who call these areas home. Brian will begin today with some opening comments on our financial results and recent company developments, followed by an update from Wayne and Bob on their respective business segments. Brian, Bob, and Wayne will then take questions from the investment community. Please note that a replay of the conference call, a short supplementary presentation, and a transcript will be available on our website at canadianutilities.com and can be found in the investor section under the headings events and presentations. I'd like to remind you that our remarks today will include forward-looking statements that are subject to important risks and uncertainties. For more information on these risks and uncertainties, please see the reports filed by Canadian Utilities with the Canadian Securities Regulators. And finally, I'd like to point out that during this presentation, we may refer to certain non-GAAP and other financial measures, such as total of segment measures, adjusted earnings, adjusted earnings per share, and capital investment. These measures do not have any standardized meaning under IFRS. And as a result, they may not be comparable to similar measures presented in other entities. And now I'll turn the call over to Brian for his opening remarks. Thanks, Colin, and good morning, everyone. Thank you all very much for joining us today for our fourth quarter 2023 conference call. 2023 was a great year for Canadian Utilities Limited. We achieved adjusted earnings of $596 million or $2.21 per share for 2023. This performance was in line with our expectations for 2023 given the rebasing occurring in our Alberta-based distribution utilities during the year and the receding inflation in our Australia natural gas distribution business. Overall, our ACO Energy Systems business continue to perform very well with our transmission utilities providing stable stability and continued strong operating performance to help offset the pressures associated with rebasing at our distribution utilities. On the electric distribution side, we saw rate-based growth, efficiency carryover mechanism, and operational efficiencies to help to partially offset this rebasing pressure in the period. Similarly, in our Alberta-based natural gas business, rate-based growth, operational efficiencies, and the efficiency carryover mechanism provided similar relief. Moving to our natural gas distribution business in Australia, we continue to see strong growth in key operating metrics, such as new connections, tariff rates, and system volumes throughout the year. Australia's in-country inflation profile, however, continued to be the driving factor of the year-over-year -year earnings pressure experience. As we discussed in our conference calls throughout 2023, 
2022 saw inflation build rapidly, especially in the second half of the year, with full-year inflation reaching almost 8% by year-end 2022. As a result of this building profile, our 2022 earnings were exceptionally strong and created a comparable that was difficult to compete with in 2023 as inflation levels began to moderate. This trend resulted in us reporting a year-over-year decline of 20 million for this business in the year. Looking ahead to 2024, in-country estimates continue to suggest a further moderation inflation with estimates in the 3 to 3.2 percent range and we do expect this to create further pressure on Australia earnings. We do not however expect the same degree of year-over-year volatility in 2024 comparables as full year 2023 inflation for Australia declined to 4 percent by year-end. With Wayne joining us for the conference call today, this is likely a great point for me to pass the call over to him to speak a little bit more about the successes that we saw in the ACO Energy Systems business in 2023 and how we're seeing things shape up for 2024. Wayne? Thank you, Brian, and good morning to all, and thank you for taking the time. Um, As you alluded to in your opening comments, 2023 saw our business face some meaningful challenges and and, um, cyclicity. Despite this, however, we delivered results that were in line with expectations and consistent with those that were previously communicated. While rebasing pressures, while rebasing pressured earnings in the year, it highlights the degree to which we've been successful at unlocking efficiencies within the business and the benefits that we've been able to share with customers as a result. Since starting our first PBR cycle in 2013 and considering the impacts of inflation, we've unlocked a 29% reduction in O&M cost per kilometer of electric distribution line and a 39% reduction in natural gas distribution costs per customer. Those are very meaningful for our customers here in Alberta. They, this meaningful savings and allows us to continue to be a safe, reliable, and efficient systems operator as we invest to meet the changing needs of our customers, and that is at the core of our long-term strategy. Well, I know that Brian and I have touched on this during previous conference calls. It's worth reiterating that 2023 saw us receive prospective regulatory decisions for both our generic cost of capital, or GCOC, and our third PBR cycle, which has now kicked off in 2024. As expected, the GCOC decision included the adoption of a formulatic approach to ROE and the increasing of our improved ROE from 8.5% to 9.28% for 2024. This is a meaningful increase and one that will help support strong performance as we move forward. While I won't dig into the details of the PBR3 decision in this call, It was largely in line with our expectations, and we believe it provides a solid foundation for us to continue to deliver strong performance throughout the next PBR term. Most importantly, and as highlighted by both of these decisions, we continue to see prospectivity from our regulators, a clear understanding and the need for fair and reasonable returns on critical utility investments, and the importance of ensuring that the energy system remains reliable as society's energy needs continue to grow and evolve. As we think about 2024 more broadly, we see a very strong economic backdrop in our core Alberta market. We are seeing exceptionally strong population growth, housing starts, industrial activity, and broad economic expansion And all of these show that the province will see strong growth in the coming years. Along with these core economic drivers, we continue to see a need and a growing need to invest in our systems to ensure the ongoing reliability and safety uh, as we adapt to climate change and to support the broader societal decarbonization objectives. Collectively, these factors support an expectation for rate-based growth to increase in the coming years, and we see plenty of opportunities for us to invest within our existing footprint. 
In 2023, we invested $1.2 billion in our core utilities within ATCO Energy Systems. This ongoing utility investment ensures the continued generation of stable earnings and reliable cash flows from our utilities business and drives rate-based growth. Given the strong trends that we are seeing in our core operating geographies, we expect to invest $4.1 to $4.8 billion in our regulated utilities over the next three years, and for this to drive an annual rate base growth of somewhere between 3 and 4.4%. In addition, we expect over the longer term to reach the 5% growth level. While the lower end of this range is believed to be readily achievable, Based on our current regulatory filings, our ability to demonstrate the need for prudent investment to our regulator through additional filings will be required in order to achieve the higher end of these ranges. And with those comments, I'll pass it back to you, Brian. Thanks, Wayne, and great points. While 2023 was, on one hand, a transition year for the Alberta distribution utilities as they exited the second PBR cycle, it was also a key foundation building year as they enter their third PBR cycle and we continue to look for opportunities to drive additional growth across the wider ACO Energy Systems portfolio. <clears throat> Moving on to our ACO Empower business, we delivered adjusted earnings of $50 million in 2023 compared to $35 million in 2022. Supporting this year-over-year -year growth was our acquisition of the 40 Mile and Adelaide Wind Assets in 2023, along with the energization of our Barlow, Deerfoot, and Emperor Solar Assets in the year. Beyond, beyond this earnings growth, 2023 also saw us deliver a number of achievements related to our overall strategy. To talk about some of the other achievements that ACO and Power Business achieved in the year and some of the strategic items that are front of mind heading into 2024, I will now turn the call over to Bob. Thank you, Brian. You are correct. 2023 was a big year for ACO and Power as we continue to execute our strategy. We signed a number of key long-term offtake agreements for our developments, including those with Microsoft and Lafarge. In Australia, we were selected as a preferred partner in the delivery of the South Australian government's hydrogen jobs plan, a plan that will see us work as part of a consortium with Bach Lindy to deliver a strategy and development program for the government's 250 megawatt hydrogen production facility, along with a 200 megawatt hydrogen fueled electricity generating facility and related hydrogen storage. Back here in Canada, I'd also specifically highlight the work we did with the Chiniki and Good Stony First Nations and the project financing we completed on 40 mile wind backed by our contracted sales volumes. In 2023, we brought the Chiniki and Good Stony First Nations into our Deerfoot and Barlow solar developments, making them 51% owners in the projects. Not only does this partnership support energy transition and our overall strategy related to renewable generation and indigenous engagement, it creates meaningful and long lasting economic returns for these communities. And Power focused our efforts over the last 18 months to contract our Canadian sales volumes into long term virtual power purchase arrangements, which has culminated now with our 2024 Canadian sales volumes under virtual PPAs, totaling 71% of our overall platform. This approach provided the opportunity for NPower to complete a limited recourse project financing on 40 mile wind, totaling gross proceeds of $292 million. Partnerships and collaboration contracting a significant portion of future generation through virtual PPAs and project level financing remain the cornerstone, cornerstone values of our business and areas that will only grow in importance as we continue to pursue our growth objectives for renewables and our ultimate goal of owning, developing and managing more than a thousand megawatts of renewable generation by 2030. On the hydrogen front, we remain committed to our development project within Alberta's industrial heartland and to meeting the growing demands for clean hydrogen in the economy more broadly. 
This involves the, the development of both a carbon sequestration hub with Shell and our Heartland Hydrogen Hub project. Since our last discussion, our last update, we've continued to advance conversations with project partners and off-takers, while also progressing the technical work necessary to support a feed decision in 2024 on our hydrogen hub project in the heartland, and an FID decision on our carbon sequestration project with Shell. As has always been the case, an executable business case for these projects will include strong commercial, financial, and offtake partners. These partners are key to guaranteeing the project's long-term success to ensure the right partners are obtained we're currently undergoing a live and competitive process to select these project partners and expect to have clarity on the outcomes of this process by mid-year. In terms of capital investment within ADCO and Power, 2023 saw us invest $837 million into the business, an increase of $597 million from 2022. This increased investment reinforces our commitment to energy transition and was made up primarily of our renewable electricity asset acquisition that was completed at the beginning of the year. This acquisition saw us acquire both the operating 40 mile and Adelaide wind assets along with a renewable generation development pipeline. Also included in our capital investment were a number of projects that we've already talked about today, including our Barlow, Deerfoot, and Empress solar projects. Looking to the future, our hydrogen initiatives and the successful execution of our renewable generating pipeline will all necessitate significant capital investment. We're currently evaluating yesterday's Government of Alberta announcement on the renewable moratorium. More details is definitely required. However, I'm not surprised with their position, but we can discuss that further in a Q&A session. In the near term, we expect capital recycling, partnering, and our existing sources of capital to provide the necessary funding support to support these growth efforts. As we continue towards final investment decisions on key developments, including our hydrogen project in the Alberta heartland, we will constantly evaluate our funding program to ensure that sufficient capital is available to support this growth. We continue to believe that the demand for clean hydrogen and renewable electricity will only grow as industry and governments seek to reduce carbon intensity while ensuring a stable and reliable supply of energy. With that update, Brian, I'll pass things back to you. Thanks, Bob. Great to hear about the growth that's happening within ACO and Power and the ways in which that supports not just earnings, but the numerous communities with whom we interact. Overall, our 2023 results were in line with our expectations for the rebasing year. The earnings pressures we expected related to rebasing and the Australian inflation were evident in our results, but the overall impact was softened by the exceptional operating performance of all our segments, and we end 2023 with a stable base on which to build for 2024. Our ACO energy system business is seeing favorable growth trends on the horizon and is entering its third performance-based regulation cycle with regulatory prospectivity and a more favorable R&B and ROE environment. Our ACO and power business continues to execute on its renewable electricity development and laying the groundwork for key decisions on our ongoing clean fuels development. Overall, Canadian Utilities is, a great, is in a great position heading into 2024, and I'm excited to watch the business grow moving forward. As I conclude my prepared remarks, I want to thank everyone for their investment in Canadian Utilities Limited and the support that you've provided our business throughout the years. As many of you have seen, I recently announced that I'll be retiring from Canadian Utilities Limited effective March 1st, and that this will be my last conference call as your Chief Financial Officer. It has been an honor to serve as a leader within various segments of your business for the last 24 years, and I work and to work with the incredibly talented team that we have here.
Canadian Utilities has an exciting road ahead, and I know that Katie Patrick and the rest of the leadership team here will steward the business masterfully as the story progresses. That concludes my prepared remarks. I will now turn the call back to Colin. Thank you, Brian. On behalf of all of us at Canadian Utilities, I'd like to thank you for your contributions over the last 24 years. I know for me it's been a privilege to work with you, and uh, I'm going to miss you. So. In the interest of time, we ask that you limit yourself to two questions. If you have any additional questions, you are welcome to rejoin the queue. I will now turn it over to the conference coordinator for questions. Thank you. To join the question queue, you may press star, then one on your telephone keypad. You will hear a tone acknowledging your request. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing any keys. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. The first question comes from Linda Ezergalis with TD Cohen. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, before I ask my question, uh, Brian, I want to congratulate you on a very successful career and wish you all the best in your retirement. Thanks, Linda. Um, I guess my first question is just uh, the news of the day. In terms of um, the uh, Alberta um, uh, announcement uh, yesterday, how might we think of um, your evolving appetite uh, to invest in renewables, uh, specifically with some of the um, um, unclear um, definition of what a pristine uh, viewscape might be and, and how different uh, stakeholders might uh, define that differently. Can you just uh, talk about uh, how you see um, your presence in the pro province evolving and what you might do to mitigate uh, that uncertainty? Hi, Linda. Thank you for that, Bob, here. I, I totally agree. I actually smiled when you mentioned the, the words about pristine because when, in my remarks when I commented around we need more detail, that was one of the areas is what does that mean? The, the positive thing, in my mind anyway, for our assets is many of our, the, the development pipeline, the assets that we acquired are in the eastern part of the province. And I know in some of the conversations we've had with government, it was more a focus around kind of the foothills and, and the pristine views of the mountains. Um, th those are my views on, on what I think is going to happen. But, I mean, again, the devil's in the detail. Um, I still believe that renewables are a key part of the growth in the province. Do I believe that renewables are going to solve electricity requirements when it gets to minus 30? No, I don't. But I do think they, they play a pretty important role through energy transition for, for ourselves and, and for the province. Thank you. And uh, maybe as my uh, follow-up question, just uh, switching gears a bit, a bit in terms of um, how to achieve uh, decarbonization and energy transition. Um, the three-year outlook uh, on CapEx um, is going to probably um, be influenced heavily uh, by uh, what goes on in terms of natural gas demand in the Heartland industrial area. Um, when might we see um, Canadian utilities making incremental uh, regulatory filings and what are What's your expectation in terms of the actual um, potential incremental capex uh, when that might be uh, spent? Would that be more in the uh, outer years of your three-year planning process, or can you just comment on um, how uh, how that might firm up? Thanks, Linda. It's Wayne. That's a great question, and and yeah, when we look um, over the next three and and even five-year horizon. We're seeing those ever increasing investment um, signals or demands fundamentally driven from a couple of areas. We're seeing uh, a lot of what we would call organic growth um, across our utilities that, that is really driven, as I mentioned, by you know inward population and housing starts. Um, I think though, and, and you kind of called it out, we shouldn't forget the large number of significant industrial developments and, frankly, announcements in the Heartland, um, Greater Edmondson area. And, um, you know, there will be more to come in 2024 as we advance uh, our ability to deliver natural gas to those projects. There are um, 
a regular there is a regulatory decision underway uh, that sort of flowed out of our um, pipelines GRA um, to support that and I think you will see us later in the year um, making subsequent um, regulatory applications in order to address other climate adaptation um, opportunities or needs for our customers. Thank you. The next question comes from Mark Jarvie with CIBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Yeah, good morning. Uh, first, happy retirement to you, Brian. Well deserved. Um, so maybe on the range of the rate base growth that you provided, what kind of moves you to the upper end of the range? Um, and, and would the base case be at the midpoint right now? Um, thanks, Mark. It's Wayne. The, no, I would say the base case is actually just the base case. Um, we're confident that we can get there. The upper end of the range is going to require, um, you know, as we indicated in the in the documents, is going to require um, support and applications um, from the regulator. But we're feeling pretty good about the base case. So just to follow up on that, just with the GRA pending on on the gas transmission side of things, how does that factor into what's you know currently shown as the three year sort of growth on rate base? And then how much more of a supplemental application or what the process is to ramp that up to get to the top end of the of the growth range for the uh, gas transmission business well on the on the gra um application that that is currently there and and you know brian will brian will add to my comments but we have reached a negotiated settlement on um on that application there is, however, an ongoing um, piece of work around uh, CWIP or um, or the ability to um, support some of our larger ongoing projects, and we would expect the result of that kind of mid-year. Yeah, Wayne. Just and Mark, just to to further add to Wayne's comments, we anticipated the incremental growth within our transmission business, and so we included a placeholder. Uh, for a deferral account, which would, you know, facilitate a more um, speedier process to to address the the um, expected capital increase in there, and also to put in mechanisms that would give us a kind of a cash return as we construct this potential large project. So, th those are some of the proactive things that we did, and as Wayne alluded to, we'll follow that with. Uh, needs applications and further as we go, but we wanted to ensure that we had kind of the key uh, base foundation in our regulatory filings and we'll, we'll progress from there. Okay, and then last question, just to kind of clarify, when you talk about pushing to 4 to 5%, is, is that at the upper end of that range you provide in the MDNA, which is 4.4, or, or do you think there's potential in sort of a 3 to 5 year horizon to push above the 4.4% range, uh, closer to five. Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, I'm forming my views, Mark, on on really that strong um, underpinning economic growth in the province, and um, and what we see as requirements and needs for climate adaptation. So, uh, you know, I. We published the numbers we published, and and we're going to stand by those numbers. But honestly, as I think about the next five, six, seven years in Alberta, um, it is a very positive environment, and you know it's um, it's up to us as the utility. You know, we're a fundamental driver of a lot of that growth and supporter of a lot of that growth, and so. You know, rest assured that our teams are committed to supporting all of our customers. Um, through that next five and and beyond year horizon. Okay, maybe just one quick follow-up. Just, you know, with customers, affordability, just as you went through the negotiated settlement, particularly in the GRA and maybe just the outreach, how are you seeing acceptance around that incremental needed investment and the ability to get that, uh, I guess, buy-in from customers for that incremental investment to drive the rate-based growth higher? Yeah, for sure. And I, you know, I, you would have heard in in the prepared remarks, um, frankly, the phenomenal job that our teams have been able to do in terms of cost savings 
um, historically. So, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to downplay the, the need for us to keep one eye on operating efficiencies and continuing to drive O&M costs down. I think that is the, um, the path for us in terms of affordability. That the flip side of that, of course, is um, we continue to see strong customer feedback and demand for increased supply and increased reliability. And, and I personally believe over the next decade, um, we're going to continue to see an ever-increasing desire by customers for an ever-increasing level of reliability. And so that's how we're thinking about our investments moving forward. Understood. And once again, Brian, congratulations. Thanks, Mark. The next question comes from Maurice Choi with RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Um, Wayne, if I could just pick up on a previous question a little bit and to clarify, are you saying that you're expecting to reach 4 to 5% in the next five to seven years, and, and that is all largely driven by economic and population growth? Yeah, I think what we said is in the longer period, um, you know, beyond beyond the three-year view, um, we are going to um, we we anticipate being able to see those um, those ranges. We recognize that is um, five years out, Maurice, and um, you know, I I'm not suggesting that it's just based on um, customer growth. I think yeah, I go back to our pillars and our strategy is really around um, supporting our customers as they continue to evolve. So we we have a very strong um, kind of line of sight to both industrial and commercial and residential growth today. The longer term is is our view of climate adaptation, investments in our utilities to support um, decarbonization and those it just occurs to us that those trends um, are, you know, in some ways universal, but are certainly hard, you know, well at play and well at hand here in Alberta. Understood. And, and maybe just keeping on the same theme about growth here. Obviously, the capex is going to rise due to law law of large numbers. Um, Brian, could you speak to your equity needs to deliver this rate-based growth and up to you whether or not you want to speak to that uh, in the context of the $2.5 billion for renewables and almost $5 billion for hydrogen project or not. Yeah, thanks, Maurice. And as as you alluded to, and Wayne outlined, uh, we do see, um, you know, some considerable growth opportunities over over the long term. And, and as we do that, we'll continue to access, you know, both the debt and equity markets. And over time, with that level of growth, you'll see us um, likely to go to the equity markets. And um, and we've been communicating that through the past year. And so no no surprise in that front. And, um, you know, on, uh, on all sides of our business, we'll continue to make sure that we optimize the sources of funding as we go. And, and just to clarify, I and mean, I think it was about... I think something that Bob mentioned in his prepared remarks that to support the growth, you're expecting to perform some capital recycling alongside partnerships and existing sources of capital. Can you elaborate a little bit more about what these capital recycling potential opportunities are? Yeah, uh, Maurice, thanks, Bob here. So I'd say two key areas where we're where we reference recycling, one is in the area of renewables. We're, we're looking at partnerships in the renewables area. So as we develop our projects, we'd look to bring partners in. And so we call that kind of recycling from that perspective. And then in the other area, in our, our large hydrogen projects, we absolutely will be bringing in partners, strategic partners primarily in, in that area as well. But we really want to develop the projects ourselves and then bring partners in at a later date. That's kind of the reference to the recycling. Are you, would you contemplate selling some of the um, renewables as you de-risk them um, uh, over the course of the years? Yeah, I would say for, yeah, we would definitely consider that. 
Thank you very much. It's, not our, it's, it's definitely Maurice. It's definitely not our number one priority to to just sell them, but we we will consider that for sure. That makes sense, and I'll, I'll share my congratulations to Brian on your retirement tomorrow, and best of luck as well. Thanks, Maurice. The next question comes from Patrick Kenny with National Bank Financial. Please go ahead. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Um, Maybe just coming back to the Alberta government's announcement this week. So they indicated some changes still to come here on, you know, how electric transmission costs might be allocated or I guess recovered across the system. Uh, just wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, how these changes might impact your overall business risk profile, um, say with the rating agencies. If, for example, a higher proportion of revenue comes from, you know, a, a more concentrated group of renewable power developers as opposed to, you know, your diversified pool of end-use customers. And, you know, following on that, do you think these changes could call for a higher equity thickness down the road versus the relatively low 37% that's in place right now? Thanks, Patrick. Great question. And um, I guess to answer your question, no, we don't anticipate any with the changes, any impact to our, our risk as a regulated utility to, um, you know, the regulatory compact allows us to recover our prudently incurred costs and provides that opportunity. So although the the um, the mix of who pays for electric tr uh, transmission may change, we don't anticipate any of that impact on our, on our business. Uh, we will continue to push for higher equity thickness. I think we've uh, did that in the last GCOC and some work continue to be done there as we um, try to, um, again, get our equity thickness probably more in line with kind of North American peers. But um, but to answer your question simply, no, we don't anticipate any any impacts on our, our uh, credit metrics or, um, you know, risk on, on the electric transmission opportunities. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Um, and then maybe just a, a follow up on your, your comments around the strong population growth in the province. Um, just wondering if you're starting to see any relief from, a, you know, a workforce availability perspective, um, or if labor shortages are still a concern as you look to, you know, execute on your growth plans here in Alberta over the coming years. Yeah, I, I can I can address that. Um, you know, I, I think one goes hand in hand with the other. If, if we're, if you're being, um, if you're thinking about it the right way, people are, are coming to Alberta for, um, career opportunities, for jobs, for, you know, to participate in the economy. And as a result, they bring skills and, and expertise that then helps Alberta grow and, and execute, um, so I, so I think it, it all kind of leads a little bit hand in glove. Uh, there is a very large pipeline of very large projects that are, um, either have been announced or, um, you know, we would all expect will be announced over the, over the coming months and years. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I think there will no doubt be some um, challenges around, you know, trades and and some of those activities. We have a long-standing um, strategy of investing in our people and investing in our teams, and um, you know, uh, a focus on on development of uh, workforce, and we will continue to do that throughout Alberta. And um, you know, these are all features of a growth economy, and we're we're very pr proud and pleased to be part of it. Okay, great. Appreciate your comments, and uh, all the best, Brian. Thanks, Patrick. The next question comes from Ben Pham with BMO. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Good morning. Uh, on the potential sanctioning of the Heartland Hydrogen CCS project, how does that influence, if any, your your capex numbers or, or rate base growth figures that you you highlighted in the report? Yeah, the um, thanks.
Ben. Um, the rate base um, numbers that Wayne went through, it wouldn't be impacted, um, uh, particularly for that hydrogen project that um, Bob's in Bob's business. Yeah, Ben, maybe just to okay. add to that is the project that I was referencing was is on the non-utility side, so it would be totally separate to, to Wayne's rate base numbers, as Brian said. And even the H2 pipe would be non-regulated? As of right now, the, the H2 pipeline that, that is part of our hydrogen heartland hub project is, would be separate as well, as of right now. Okay. And maybe this, this one's a little bit uh, I mean, a similar question. I was also thinking about more of the indirect impact too your rate based figures, just the heartland activity and moving forward a project. Have you, in a sense, indirectly flowed through the impact of this project into the reg side? Like is there, I guess, it, would there be an impact there? So the um, the numbers, it's Wayne, um, Ben, the, the rate based growth numbers are the, the that we published are um, on the basis of approved um, projects that are in the Heartland area, um, amongst others across the province. So, um, you know, to the degree there is incremental um, announcements in in years to come of additional um, large users in the Heartland area, then um, that would be one of the one of the ways that those numbers move up. Okay, and it may be my, my follow-up question then. I'm just, just looking at how you've um, broke up the rate-based rate CAGRs by uh, utility. And, and I know it's your transmission side. There's there's not a lot, um, I shouldn't say not a lot, that the growth rates uh, uh, the lowest of, of the group. Shouldn't that go up at all just with all the renewables? Stuff that's happening in in a province or or will happen or is is it just really how where your transmission is located? Uh, I you know I, I might take your eye back to the size of the transmission rate base um, to begin with. So um, it is kind of you know quite a quite a bit or far and beyond the size of the rate bases across the um, the rest of our portfolio. And so even though it is seeing capital investment um, obviously dollar for dollar requires quite a bit more in order to generate similar percentage growth rates um, there are some um, investments in the electric transmission business to support renewables I, I frankly see more in the future as we think about you know we serve um, you kind of pointed it out but we serve the um, more northern parts of Alberta and if you you know, broadly the oil and gas sector. And if you um, think about those corners of the province, growth in that electric transmission business, I think is going to be more aligned with climate adaptation and reliability enhancements. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. The next question comes from Jessica Hoyle with Scotiabank, please go ahead. Great, thanks so much for taking my question. Uh, so just to start uh, on the renewable side, uh, so just looking at your renewable development pipeline um, in your latest slide deck, just how are you thinking about progressing the pipeline in the near term? And I guess just what is required to move some of these projects to a, a positive FID? Yeah, thanks, Jessica. Bob here. The, the, in our pipeline that we acquired, we, we are already advancing one of those projects. Um, the project we, we have been advancing was not impacted directly by the moratorium, the renewables moratorium with the government. It had already been approved. The other projects that are in the pipeline were obviously not approved, so we were advancing those maybe a little bit more slowly, if I could put it that way. So we right now we're spending our time trying to understand where the government is before we really start deciding which which is the next project that we, we advance. 
Okay, thanks for that. Um, and just moving over to the utilities, uh, what kind of initial expectations do you have for performance in, in 2024 under uh, PBR3 and, and what kind of further efficiencies uh, can be realized? I mean, as you would know and have seen, Jessica, the the um, parameters for PBR3 were adjusted um, a little bit, I guess, in terms of, um, you know, wh where the earning sharing begins and um, some of those other elements. I, you know, I, I think you could look at our track record and understand that um, we are pretty focused on finding and continuing to find efficiencies in the business. And as we look out over the next five years, um, you know, it, it we get those efficiencies through technology, through um, other capital investments that then support operating efficiencies. Um, and, you know, I, I can assure you the teams are busy um, with an eye towards that. And that, that is our view of how we, um, support customer affordability. So it is a five-year cycle and um, and we're in the first year um, and, you know, we are, we are continuing to put plans in place to seek an out, uh, a level of outperformance. I, I don't want to miss the opportunity, though, to illustrate that, um, you know, we are really focused on growth in the next um, few years. And so, I believe we can achieve both, um, but I you will see both come out of our businesses. Great, thanks for the color, and uh, I wish you the best in retirement. Thanks, Jessica. This concludes the question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Mr. Colin Jackson for any closing remarks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you all for participating today. We appreciate your interest in Canadian utilities and we look forward to speaking with you again soon. This concludes today's conference call. You may disconnect your lines. Thank you for participating and have a pleasant day.